you'll turn to the book of James, chapter 2, we're going to continue our study through the book of James. Uh, last week, due to illness, we did not have service, so it's been a couple of weeks, so we'll start with review, chapter 1. Um, you know, when we look at the book of James, there have been many people that state that this book is primarily about works. And although works is important and works is a major theme in this, it is not the foundational theme of this book. The foundational theme that we must accept first before works is that this book is primarily about faith. You know, James's major theme here is to work out or living out one's faith working out uh, living one's faith and being a doer and not just a hearer of the word. And as James is addressing his audience, the major uh, heresy that he was dealing with here were people that claimed that if they had knowledge, if they had understanding, they did not need to show any works. And most specifically, works of love. As we study the book of James, it's important for us to understand the literary structure of this book. It is quite unique in our New Testament. It begins like a salutate, with a salutation, like an epistle. But this book is not written like a Pauline epistle or an epistle of Peter or epistle of John. This book follows more of a format of a collection of wisdom sayings. It's much more like the book of Ecclesiastes or the book of Proverbs. In chapter 1, when we say there are eight major Proverbs that we studied, and there are eight major wise sayings. So this book, some call this the New Testament book of poetry. As we studied chapter 1, we had eight major Proverbs we studied. That let sted, uh, The first one was, let steadfastness have its full effect. And this is by enduring trials and temptations. The second one was, if we are stable, God gives us wisdom generously. And as we studied that, we know that wisdom and knowledge are powerful tools. They are powerful and they are also dangerous in foolish hands. So if we are unstable, we shouldn't expect wisdom. But wisdom shows that we have maturity to handle these things. As a young child, we would never give a child a sharp object, a knife, or a gun, or any of these things because they are not stable enough to have these things. In the same way God sees us if we're being unstable, if we have doubt in our lives, He doesn't give us wisdom, and it's because we're not ready for it. The third problem was, if we are poor or rich, we are to make our investment in eternal things. Pastor Clark and my dad and I were talking about the pastor's pay of our churches. That the pay is horrible in what Pastor Clark said, but the benefits are great. And this is because we are making investment in eternal things. There are rewards for endurance was the fourth proverb. The fifth one is every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. Our sixth proverb was, it is the receiving of the word that empowers us to put away anger, all filthiness, and wickedness. I like thinking about the psalmist where he says, my cup runs over. And we've used this as an example before. If we have a cup and it's full of dirty water, we pour in pure, clean water over and over. And as it runs over, it is then filled with pure water. This is the same way that we put away anger and filthiness and wickedness from our lives. It's not by just trying to not do it. Because in our strength, we do not have the strength to do it. We may be able to restrain ourselves for a short time. But it is by receiving continually the Word of God that our cup runs over and the old things are washed out and new things are put into our lives. 
Our seventh proverb was to be a doer of the word and not hearers only. And our eighth one was loving the unlovely and not being concerned with the cares of the world is the true religion or our true ceremonial act before God. You know, we believe that communion is important and believer baptism is important. But if we think that those are our basic ritual acts or our sacraments as believers, we are mistaken because our true, true ceremonial acts, our true religious acts before God is loving the unlovely and being not concerned with the cares of this world, taking on the character of Christ. Chapter 1 was uh, very full of these eight Proverbs. Tonight, fortunately, we have two basic Proverbs that we're going to study within chapter 2 of James. <coughs> the first one is about partiality, or we might even think of it in today's term as prejudice. And then the second one is the, tr the fruit of true faith. The fruit of true faith is works. Chapter 2, starting in verse 1. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in this good place. While you say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit down by my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? And James here is giving us an application from the Old Testament law. As we are finishing up the New Testament epistles, and we're going to venture in short, in, in short time here into the Old Testament law books as we believe there is application of even the Old Testament for New Testament believers today. We're going to study these things. And James gives us explicitly here an application from the law, both Leviticus and Deuteronomy. In Leviticus 19.15, it says, You shall do no injustice in court. You should not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. And then also in Deuteronomy 117, you shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You should not be, be intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God. And the case that is too hard for you, you shall bring to me and I will hear it. And we see here our status as people, our, our monetary status, whether I drive a BMW or I drive my beat-up Chevy, our status makes no appeal to, before God. And Paul states it this way in Ephesians 6, 9, Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that He who is both their Master and your Master in heaven that there is no partiality in him. Whether you are poor or whether you are rich makes no difference before God. And then we see that the poor by earthly standards are very much not treated fair. But we know this, that God looks out for the poor. And we could study many, many scriptures of how God cares for the poor. But I'll pull out one tonight. Proverbs 22.22 22. Do not rob the poor because he is poor or crush the afflicted at the gate for the Lord will plead their case and rob of life those who rob them. If we are poor we have the confidence tonight that God takes care of us. 
And that brings us into another subject. And this probably won't get a lot of traction on the radio, especially where there's a lot of prosperity doctrine taught out there. And there is a biblical point of biblical prosperity. We believe that absolutely. But there is also blessings, the blessings of poverty. Probably not a very popular subject. But God says there is blessings in poverty. And this won't be a complete doctrinal summary of this, but I'm going to hit some highlights about this. As we studied here in verse 5 of James chapter 2, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? And James is really here referencing Jesus. He is referencing Jesus speaking on the Beatitudes in Luke 6.20 where he says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And as we look at the blessings of poverty, many times when we study it scripturally, it is poverty with, or poverty plus something, that there's blessings in poverty. And the first one here is poverty with joy. And poverty with joy can produce generosity. In 2 Corinthians 8, 2, For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed into wealth of generosity on their part. As Paul is speaking about the poor churches in Macedonia, as these poor people in Macedonia gathered up a collection to send to the poor believers in Jerusalem. And then our second one would be, would be poverty with righteousness is a blessing. Poverty with righteousness. In Psalms 37, 16, it says, Better is a little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. When we have righteousness, even with poverty, we have something greater, greater than all earthly prosperity. Then there's poverty with integrity. If we have poverty with integrity, Proverbs 19, 1, it says, better is a poor person who walks in the integrity than one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. And I think a very important point here is when we give out of our poverty, many times we have given all. And this is truly what the Lord requires, is that we give all. And this is what uh, Jesus is speaking about in Mark 12, 43. And he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put more in all those who are contributing in the offering box. For they all contribute out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put everything she had, all she had to live on. Because our value of what we give is not which president is on that piece of green that I put in the box, but it is what my personal cost was. Whether I give two pennies, and if it's all I have, I've given everything before God. Then someone that has billions that might give a million dollars to a cause. It is our personal cost that it was what matters before God. We also study here as poverty with labor. There is a blessing of poverty with labor. labor. And that is poverty with labor gives us good sleep. In Ecclesiastes 5.12, those who work hard all day come home and sleep in peace. It is not important if they have a little or much to eat, but the rich worry about their wealth and are not able to sleep. And as I was studying about this, I thought of Michael Jackson. You know, Michael Jackson, very rich man, famous musician. Um, When he died, he had one of the world's largest funerals. But he died because he could not sleep. And the doctor gave him too much drugs and killed him. Because as a, even as a very rich man that could have anything he wanted, 
anything he wanted. As a little boy, he could not have, he could not go to an amusement park. So as a man, he built himself an amusement park. But he could not sleep. With poverty and labor, you will sleep well. And then finally here, as we talk about blessings of poverty, with poverty, we always have hope. In Psalms 9, 18, For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. You know, many times when you're very rich and you have much, you forget the reliance upon God. You somehow start to believe that it is something in you that has given you these blessings. But the impoverished, they have always hope of better days. You know, many times when you feel that you're at your lowest point, you get to that point and you have hope. You say there's nowhere else to go but up. And this is the hope of poverty. Back to James chapter 2, verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law, and concentrate there for a minute on royal law, according to the Scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing a sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. And if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are being judged under the law of liberty. The law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. But mercy triumphs over judgment. And James is talking about here the greatest commandment. I was listening to Christian radio this week and uh, this was like a missions uh, commercial or something on there. And it was interesting that and they actually got into the statistics and I can't remember this off the top of my head but how many People that sit in church pews today have no idea what the Great Commission is. And amongst millennials, it's, of course, much smaller. And amongst older believers, it's not that much better. But how many churchgoers today have no idea what the Great Commission is? And I thought about this. I wonder if they know what the greatest commandments are. The greatest commandment. And this is given in Matthew 22:34. But when the Pharisees heard that they had silenced that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked the question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And he said to them that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. For this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And James is talking about here in judgment, uh, judgment according to the royal law, he, as he puts it. And when we think of the royal law, the royal law is the very highest level of law. The very highest level of law. And it's important that this royal law is a law of the heart and not that of the flesh. It is a not, it's not a don't do this or don't do that. It is at the heart that we are to love. We love God first and then we love others. It is a law over my heart, not over my flesh. And then a royal law is always something put forth by a king. Because we have a king that governs a kingdom. And then James also calls this the law of liberty. And as Pastor Steve had talked about at Pastor Bob's conference, that there's two economies with which man can operate today. An economy of debt or an economy of grace. 
And both of these economies have laws which man operates. Now the economy of debt, which was put before man, which we call the law, it is only there. It was its express purpose is to show us that we in and of ourselves cannot pay that debt. It is to show us our sinfulness, show us our shortcoming, show us that we need a Savior. But the law of grace, in the law of grace we owe nothing. And in this owing nothing, owing nothing to our Lord, it empowers us because it imputes and then also it imparts. And this is why it is a law of liberty to the believer. It is a law of liberty to the believer. That we would love God. He would pour His love into us. And then we would be able to love others. This is God empowering us. And this is why mercy will triumph over judgment. Verse 14 of chapter 2. Back to James. James. What good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? This is a rhetorical question. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and you say to one of them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So let's think about works just a minute here. Because we need to ask yourself, what are works? And works are probably pretty important. If you looked in a King James concordance, <coughs> the word works or work happens 188 times in our New Testament. <coughs> As you study this, you find that the works of Jesus in the Greek is a little bit different word than what James is using here. Because the word for Jesus' works is the word deutimus. It's where we get our word dynamite from. And this is also used to express the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've got a little paraphrased definition of what Thayer says this word deutimus or works of Jesus is. It is strength, it is power, it is ability, it is inherent power. It is power for performing miracles. It is moral power and excellence of soul. It is the power of influence by having riches or wealth, or power arising from controlling numbers, or military power as controlling armies or forces. These are the works of Christ. When it talks about works, it's from and in him inherently. But this word that James uses here in the book of James, this word that he used for works is not deutimus, it's eron. And this word eron or ergon means business or employment. It is enterprise or an undertaking. It is productivity, anything that we do by hand or by industry or by mind or by our acts or our deeds. Those are what works referring to people means. So let's think, we, we've just defined what works are. We see that works of Jesus are things inherent. Works for the believer are things we do. But what are not works? What, what, what is works not? Works is not my I don't do's. And many times you'll hear many pastors preach from the pulpit. And we should always call sin, sin. I'm not saying that. But they will talk about works. And then you ask them what are the works. Or they'll preach about these works. And it will be, I don't watch television. I don't listen to this type of music. I don't smoke, cuss, or chew. Or I don't do whatever else they want to say. And these are not our works. It's important for us to abstain from sin, absolutely. But don't think that our don't do's are our works. Let's not confuse these things. So what is the most important work for the believer? 
What is that most important work? And Jesus answers this in John 6, 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him who he hath sent. Belief is our foundational work that we can do to please God. As in Hebrews 11, 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he hath cometh. To, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So what if we do great works, but we do not have this foundational work of belief? Well, in Matthew 6, it says, it, it talked about Jesus. He talked about men that gave money and they prayed and they fasted. But without faith, without faith, these Pharisees, when they would do these great things, their reward was only the attaboy that they got from others looking at them. That was their only reward, is what other people would compliment them on. And then in Matthew 7, 22, Jesus says, Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that name, in your name? In thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. We have to look at this very carefully. Because any work that we do, if it is not based on my foundational faith in Jesus Christ, if it's not Him working through me, that work, no matter how great it looks on the outside, is a work of iniquity. So why are we called for works? Matthew 6, 4, and also in verse 18, God will reward us openly for our works. In Matthew 6, 20, there is treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt. And where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. As pastors here at Grants Lake Tabernacle of God in Aspen Grove, it's not the salary we're looking for. It's like Pastor Clark said, it's the retirement. And then most importantly, we do works for this. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Then also in Ephesians 2, 10. For ye are his workmanship created in Jesus Christ unto or to do good works which he has before ordained that we should walk in them. God did not just create us did not just create us just to save us. He created us with a purpose. And that purpose is fellowship with Him as in 1 Corinthians 1.9 and 1 John 1.7. And it is also, as we've studied here, He has saved us to do good works. You know, faith is the only thing we can do that pleases God. And it is the only means of our salvation. Faith in Jesus Christ's blood being shed for our sins is the only way. And I am made pure in the sight of a perfect God. It is the only way to have new life and to enter into the kingdom. But works are the means by which I gain the delight of my Heavenly Father. And He rewards me for these works that I do. I have assurance of what Jesus Christ has done in me by my works. And most importantly, most importantly, our works are the only way that we can share our faith and bring others to Christ into the kingdom of God. Back up to verse 18, James chapter 2. But some will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one? You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, 
that faith apart from works is useless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith is active along with his works by faith. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that the person see that a person is justified by works and not faith alone. In the same way also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as a body apart from the spirit is dead, so also is faith apart from works is dead. I say this many times. Faith changes things. It changes things in us because faith is not an, it is not passive. Faith is active. And as James is defining here, he is breaking this down that there is saving faith and then there is also just a mere belief. And mere belief is demonic belief. It is like the demons did in Matthew 8.29 and they cried out, this is the demons, what have we to do with you, O Son of God, as they were speaking to Jesus? And in Mark 1.24, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Another demon confessing Jesus as Lord, but not with a state of saving faith, but of mere belief. So faith, saving faith, mere belief is only knowledge. It is an acknowledgement. It is a passive belief. It makes no change in a person's life. It bears no fruit. It has no seed. It is like the seeds that Jesus talked about in, the, uh, in Matthew 13 in the parable of the sower. It is the seeds that are thrown by the wayside. They have no roots. They're choked up by thorns. It does not save. It does not produce fruit. It does not grow. But saving faith is the seeds that have fallen on the good ground. It produces fruit. It grows. It lives. And James is contrasting here that a mere belief is like giving someone just a good word an empty word when they're hungry and starving. Or saying to someone that is cold, be warm. Just be warm. It has no power. There is nothing in it. But it is a faith that produces nothing. And this is what Paul, uh, a, a mere belief is a faith that produces nothing. And it's what Paul is speaking of in Ephesians. In Ephesians 2, chapter, or verse 1 through 10, and we're going to end on this thought tonight. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. This is mere belief. It's still dead. In which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loves us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together. He made us alive together with Christ. By the grace, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us, seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show us immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and it is not by your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of your works 
so that any man may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Works apart from faith do nothing for us. And faith that does not prove works is only a mere belief. It is not the faith alone by which we are saved. Faith is alive and it will produce works in the believer's lives. And this is God's work in us. It is not our work because we are His workmanship in Christ Jesus.